Welcome to another VNBlock screencast. In this screencast, I'm going to learn Rust, the Rust programming language, that is. And why would I be doing that? Well, because Rust is a language that is taking blockchain by storm. It is becoming more and more popular. Um, third generation blockchains such as Cosmos, Polkadot, Nia and so on are using Rust and support Rust for smart contracts and it is an interesting topic to learn to be at the forefront of this new technology or new movement into this technology and I personally enjoy learning programming languages and new implementations of the programming language. And so without further ado, let's let's get started. So my approach is going to be to use this book, the Rust Programming Language book. And I'm just going to go through this and uh, step by step and, and um, you can follow along with me. Right. And I'll create uh, some um, bookmarks in the video so that you can you can easily jump to different sections. But obviously, you know, you can also read this book. The URL is here. I'll put that in the show notes as well. So when you're getting started with any program language, obviously the first thing you want to do is install the programming language um, compiler or um, runtime interpreter, depending on the type of language that you're um, using. Now in Rust, Rust is a compiled language. So we will firstly need to download Rust through RustUp, which is a command line tool managed, which manages Rust versions and associated tools. Um, so they recommend that's the approach we take. Okay, well, this is the bit here that we are interested in. I would, what I'm gonna do is just take a look at this before I run it. Well, yes, as you can see, it's uh, almost 800 lines of code here, a bash script. Uh, so obviously, if you're paranoid, like you probably should be, it's uh, probably a good idea to, if you're gonna run this file, to run it in a sandbox environment. So you could use something like uh, git pod or something like that to, to install RustUp. Um, now I've already installed RustUp on my local computer and I'm running a Mac so I've also run this. I'm going to skip through the Windows stuff and just to show you I've got everything installed I'm going to run this command here which is rust c version. So I've got over here my terminal Let's take a look at this. Ah, I copied the dollar sign there and that. That's interesting. And there we go. It's running Rust C 1741. So let's take a look and just see what is the latest version of Rust C. Okay, interesting. Uh, let's have a look here. 1750. Hmm, isn't that the one I'm running? Almost. <laughs> Uh, it's probably the, the version I've got, right? So, that's great. Now, what else do we have here? Um, yeah, updating the path. And, oh, we can update just by simply running Rust up update. Now, it's a bit strange that these, these copies from this documentation include this dollar sign every time, because I don't obviously need that. So, every time you paste, you need to go in and delete that. But let's have a look. Right, I'm just going to run the update just for fun. It should update to the latest version, which is 175. And cool, it looks like it's installed Rust compi um, compiler, Rust C 1.75. I'll clear the screen out and we can take a look at that. And yay, we're on the very latest version of Rust. Okay, and hopefully that doesn't provide, uh, cause any problems having the very latest version. Sometimes it can do, in, in my experience, um, and you might get some odd behavior. It depends, it depends if this was built from a nightly. Um, no, probably not, because it's quite old. Well, old is in uh, almost, an, almost three weeks old, so I'm sure it is um, stable. Okay, now you can uninstall it using that, which I won't do. And then, interestingly, it comes with the local documentation. If you run rust up dock, you get this, which is kind of cool. It's running locally on my machine here. Okay, 
So next up is Hello World. So let's take a look. Uh, okay, so we will organize our projects into um, specific directories. I've already created this Hello World directory. And so the sort of Hello World program is very straightforward as it, as it should be. It's obviously a, a function and it calls something else and outputs Hello World, right? Surprise, surprise, that's kind of what you expect with the Hello World thing. I think I've already put this in here. I'm going to open up in my code editor. Cool, so this is our Rust program, .rs. Uh, it's this program here. How do we run it? How do we run it? Well, basically, we need to compile it first because remember, this is a compiled language. So we use Rust C and we pass in the file that we want to compile. So Rust C main .rs. And there's nothing output in the console, but we get this extra file here. It's just ls a. Um, so you can see it's, it's quite uh, significantly larger. Actually, let's just use h flag so we can see that. So the raw source code is just 45 bytes, but the main is 450 kilobytes. So a lot larger. Um, now, what has it done? Well, it's compiled this and compiled it into something which is not readable. It, we can't open this file in Visual Studio and wouldn't make much sense either. Okay, how do we run this? So, okay, the docs here sort of break down what this is. <clears throat> this is obviously a function, you know, so I'm not gonna go into the details of programming because this is uh, assuming you already know programming, right? <clears throat> this is about learning a new programming language given that you're already a programmer. And one interesting thing is that this is so-called Rust macro. So we're going to be learning more about that later. And okay, so it says, yeah, compiling and running are separate steps. I mean, I've come from compiled languages like C and, so, and Solidity, so I'm used to sort of compiling and then running. And then um, in order to run this, it's interesting because basically the file that you get is already a run, runnable or run uh, executable, I should say. Um, if I just do that, it outputs the um, uh, text, hello world, as expected for this type of program. I just want to take a look again at this here. Yeah, you can see it's an executable because it's got this X here. So that's interesting. So the compiler automatically produces an executable file. Now, here's an interesting note. Rust is a ahead of time compiled language, meaning that you can compile a program uh, and give it the executable to someone else and they can run it without having Rust installed. And I, I kind of like that. I like the, the fact that I can pass that main file, the larger file that the compiler produced, to anyone, even if they don't have Rust, and they can they can basically run it. Rust is nice in that sense, right? So anyway, let's move on. Next page is, <clears throat> we've gone from Hello World to Hello Cargo. So this is very Rust specific now. So Hello World is what you get with every single programming language. But Hello Cargo, well, yeah, what is Cargo? It's like a package manager. So equivalent would be npm or for, for javascript so most ruscations use this tool to manage their rust projects because cargo handles a lot of tasks for me such as building the code downloading the libraries okay so basically the simple program like hello world you can still use cargo but it would only build the program for you and it wouldn't use other parts of cargo such as the dependency manager Okay, cool. So Cargo is apparently installed with Rust up. So we can check that we have this installed. Drop that in and remove the uh, annoying dollar sign. And you can see here it's, yeah, it's picked up the right version. Okay, so this is interesting. So we're going to um, create a new Cargo project. So before I created, in the previous example, I created the Hello World folder using um, the usual tools on Linux. Um, so I use the make directory, but it looks like here cargo will do that for us. So let's try that. So I'm going to go back to my projects and I'm going to run cargo new hello cargo. Okay. And as you can see, it's created this 
uh, so-called binary application package. Let's take a look. Cool, it looks like it's created it. Okay, so let's go into Hello Cargo. Ah, and look at that, it's got a, um, a Git uh, as well, which is interesting. So that's cool. It's, it's um, set up some boilerplate for us, I guess. Actually, let's open this up and code. So we've got Cargo Tom. Um, okay, I'm familiar with this from Foundry. So, you know, you've got name and version, that kind of stuff. That's cool. Get ignore, okay, ignores the target. And then in here we've got a main RS. Oh, and it's given us the hello world. This is something I didn't really know. Um, Tommel stands for Tom's Obvious Minimal Language Format. It's interesting. There's a link to it from here as well. So yeah, Cargo's basically laid out the lay of the land, if you like, for our project. It's putting all source code into the SLC directory and everything at the top level is things like configuration. Okay, so now we're on to the good stuff. Let's build the project. So we can build it by running cargo build. Let's run that. Cargo build. Cool. Oh, created a lot of things here. It's uh, compiled. Hello cargo. It's interesting that it's saying it's compiling the um, package, if you like, rather than just this file, right? So it's compiling the whole thing. And it says it's finished, it says it's unoptimized, plus the debugging issue, in, info. There's the fancy way to run it with Cargo. Cargo run. This compiles the code and then runs the executable in one command. So this is like compile and run, cool. Cargo run, boom. Compiles and then runs it. So there's a sort of a utility command, cargo check. This checks that the file uh, compiles. Cargo check. So let's check the check, shall we? If I remove this, I, I don't know, but I'm presuming this might not compile. Okay, this doesn't complain. Okay, that's okay. That's interesting. All right, so it doesn't mind that. All right, let's just change something that I know will break. Let's just remove this. Well, I think it will break. Check. Yeah, there we go. There's the error, blah, blah, blah. Right. Um, point is, is that cargo check has told me that it's not gonna compile. So cool, so they, they could have, give us a quick recap. Let's recap it together. So we've got cargo new to create a new project. Cargo build will build and compile the project. Cargo run will build and run the project and cargo check will check if the project will compile without actually compiling it. So it's useful for, for getting um, compiler errors ahead of, um, of actually, actually running the compiler. Oh, and this is pretty cool. The cargo uh, utility works exactly the same way on Linux, Mac, and Windows. So there's no differences between the operating systems. We're just gonna quickly look at how we can build a release. So we just run cargo build dash dash release. Let's try that. And what it's done, as you can see over here, is it's created another directory. Let's uh, collapse everything and re-expand the release folder. So the release is, looks like it's pretty much the same as, as the debug. Obviously the release build is gonna be faster, more optimized, and so that's the thing you would run less often, and you would just run cargo, cargo build as you're developing for the testing purposes. Obviously, if you're gonna do any kind of benchmarking, then you will benchmark, you will want to benchmark against the release version. Cool, so just by learning cargo and going through this one chapter here, We've got the tooling and the skills already needed to at least clone and build any project in Rust. So that's pretty awesome. And uh, certainly I'm gonna be doing that uh, going forward, but not right now. Obviously there's this documentation here, which we can uh, dive into further if we needed to. And maybe this is something we can look at later. It's quite an extensive book on cargo but for now, I'm gonna move on to the next chapter. So the next chapter in this book 
dives into a real example, if you like, almost like a real world example, really. Um, and it's a guessing game. Okay, so cool. Because this is more of a real world example rather than just hello world, we're going to learn a lot more about Rust in this in this uh, section. So this program is just going to generate a number between 1 and 100, prompt you to enter the number, and then you can guess it and it will exit uh, accordingly. Okay, so the first thing we want to check is, if it, is everything <clears throat> working as expected. So we can do that by running cargo run, and it is. Cool. All right. So what we're going to do is I'm going to just basically copy this code and um, drop it straight into here. Okay, cool. So there's some things here that I recognize from other programming languages. Obviously, this must be a package uh, or a crate, I guess, which seems to be some sort of standard uh, input output library, which makes sense. Print in we know already. Um, it is a macro, right? Um, and we're going to learn more about macros later anyway. All right, now we've got our first sort of variable here. It is, so let must be very similar like JavaScript. Mut, maybe that means it's changeable, right? Mutatable. Guess is the, is the name of the variable and string new. This looks like a class of sorts, right? Very similar to looking to sort of Java or, or uh, yeah, basically that kind of thing. So it's created a string object, I guess. And then we're using the library, the IO um, STD in. So we've taken this namespace here and we are using the IO and we're using STD in, right? And I, I guess this being a, a, a library has a number of different functions on it, available on it. So we have read, read line and then this and symbol mut guess. Now this kind of format I'm not really familiar with. I'm not familiar with this and mut part, um, but the rest I think is pretty straightforward. So I'm guessing this is a standard in, it's saying read the line, so it's gonna wait, and then it's going to, whatever I type in, will it will set that to this variable. And if it doesn't work, it's gonna just say it failed it's going to output, sorry, I should say the variable. So this is like a string template here where it's able to output the variable. I guess in JavaScript you would you would normally have put a dollar sign there, but in Rust you don't need to by the looks of it. So if I run cargo run, I'm guessing this will run already. All right, guess the number, input your guess, 10, you guess 10. All right, cool. So it's working. That's nice. All right, let's carry on. Yeah, so it's a... Uh, um, ah, it comes from the standard library. Okay, so there's yeah, so there's standard library, and then there's probably external libraries, but Rust must come with a whole bunch of standard libraries as well. In fact, I dare say, if I was to Google Rust standard library, there is a whole load of stuff. Mostly, it looks like STD is where everything's at, right? Cool. Okay, so we got this uh, function as we expect. Um, pretty much, pretty much the documents going through everything I already went through. So here they're just mentioning about the fact that the top line uses this line here to import IO library, and it just allows us to write or reference it through this way rather than writing it out in the full namespace, similar to other programming languages. It talks about the read line method here and it links to it in the documentation. So we get a straight link to the <clears throat> to the Rust documentation. And of course, you know, whenever you're writing applications, you would need to go to the documentation quite frequently to figure out exactly what is going on. But we can see here that it takes and self, which I presume would be the current program that is running or the current class and then some buffer and the mutatable string and the result yeah we have to go i have to come back to this once i've gone through more of the book so to the and symbol before the variable it basically says it's a reference variable 
this basically gives you the way to let multiple parts of your code access one piece of data without needing to copy the data into memory multiple times. So it is a type by reference. Basically they say here in the book that references are immutable by default. However, you can make them mutable by basically pre prefixing it with the MUT. So yeah, they're just explaining here that this is actually one line of code, but it's it's dropped across different actual lines, but it's one line. It's, it's basically using dot notation to um, chain calls along. So we're using this library, we call read line, this waits. So this is a, a waiting um, point here. And then once this exits out with whatever I've typed in, it will then execute the Great, we're on to the second part of this game now. So we've got the first part working where it asks us for some input, but it doesn't actually play any game at this point. So we're gonna add sort of the randomized uh, generator for the game, and then check that I enter the same number and tell me if I've won or not. So interestingly, we have to use an external crate. It's not part of the standard library, so we need to use this rand crate as you can see here it's part of crates io not part of the standard library but i'm sure a lot of people use this okay cool so we're gonna add our first dependency this is cool and the way we do this is use the toml file so let's open up the cargo toml file and under dependencies we're gonna paste in this all right so the dependencies is already there so we're not going to change any code but we're going to just run cargo build so let's try that. Cargo build. Oh, look. Downloaded some crates. Downloaded get random and well, that downloaded two crates, interestingly enough. So I guess that's probably because this rand crate has other dependencies downstream. Okay, so we get a cargo lock. Actually, let's just take a look at that. Yeah, so this is like package lock and cool. It's sort of, I think it's in the toml format by the looks of it, and just allows us to reproduce this build without uh, risk of getting odd ver versions creeping in. So I'm just going to replace the whole of main RS with this. the whole thing delete paste so the addition is this rng random number generator which is part of the rand library and i should say create create <laughs> and here we're using it so we can see that there is thread underscore rng so i guess it's a threaded um, random number generator, maybe it uses multiple threads to sort of try to get the random number, generate, uh, random number generated from the underlying operating system. And, it tell, and then this is the range we want it to limit the result to. So between, I guess this basically just means between one and 100. So this kind of looks a bit like a Python range that uh, you might be used to. Or I think Ruby as well has this with double dots. Um, and I guess because there's this equal sign here, it means up to and including um, is what I'm guessing. The rest hasn't changed, but oh, it does actually output the secret number. So maybe we can take a look at that. So this would just be simply cargo run. There we go. Look, the secret number is 51. So now I can always win. Great. 15 and yeah so it seems to be working right it's generating a random number each time cool okay so this might be interesting or useful i guess particularly if we don't have internet connection at the time or something like that i presume this is running offline but we can create the dots from our entire project and it just gives us the documentation specific 
to our project, I should say. So this is actually quite useful, I guess, to just for focus purposes. Um, so you can see here that it's given us information about the very function that we're using and even even our own actual uh, application has generated a doc for it. So guess is a string and CMP must be a method on string which compares it with the number that was the secret number. And remember and means that it's a reference type. So that's fine. It basically is referencing the, that number. And I guess it's comparing the two, right? And match, not sure exactly here, but obviously this is comparing. So maybe there is, uh, you know, it compares it and then returns if it's higher than or less than the other number. And then I guess, yeah, I, I see, yeah. And then it uses this ordering to determine the output, whether it's too small, too big, or the same. Cool, yeah, that's nice. All right. We use a match expression to decide what to do next based on the variant of ordering that was returned from the call to comp or C CMP, right? Guess.cmp returns an instance of the ordering type. So the variant of that. And the match is a an expression, I guess. So it's, it's, it's saying like, okay, match the return of this. So it's almost, it's almost like a conditional, actually. Uh, I think, you know, like the way to think of this is, so it's saying if you could you could almost say if here if th and then you replace this with what it will be upon execution so you could just say if ordering less so you could put that here then do then print this out so it's like an, it's it's almost like a case statement it's probably a better way to describe it but it's nicer than other programming languages because you don't have to save this or at least you know it, commonly what you do is you have a variable and then you set you you say case blah 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 or sorry switch blah 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 and then case this case that instead here we're just saying match whatever this output is and then if it's this do this do this and it's all in the curly braces if um, the random number is 38 but the user guess is 50, the CMP method will return greater because 50 is greater than 38. And then that will trigger the match to match what the ordering greater value is and then trigger the print statement to output that code. And it will ignore anything where it doesn't match. Okay, this is interesting. It says here that it won't compile. Um, and I haven't copied this code into my example yet. So, but we can see here it says mismatched types. And it's highlighting this part here, the secret number. Now this is interesting that it's saying mismatch, mis, mis, mismatched types because guess is a string, secret number is a string, isn't it? Well, it's a rand. Is it a number or I? Oh, it might be a number type or something like that rather than yeah i thought it was a number i thought it was a string sorry but it's probably a number right so we've got i32 which is a 32-bit integer and we have unsigned as well so this is great because when we're writing and i'm thinking about smart contracts as well when i'm reading this when we write smart contracts we often use in solidity we use uint 256 a lot right <clears throat> and so this is an unsigned integer this is uh, uint 32 of course you can have uint, uint yeah this would be like a uint 32 in in solidity but yeah so we've got signed and unsigned integers are different um 
sized bits. Uh, Rust defaults to 32 bits. Makes sense. Okay, so their solution to this problem is to convert the guess string into an integer. And if they don't, if the user doesn't, then just fire back uh, the message that you expect a number. So it takes the string, trims it, and parses it. Now this is interesting, again, as well, because here, guess is a string. Down here, um, we've got guess again, and I, I, <laughs> I guess that this syntax means, hey, this is, this is of a specific type now. Here, the type has been inferred and set based on, on this here, what, it, what was returned. Uh, but here it's explicitly set. So it's kind of like a, a cast here, I guess. And it's being cast as a specific type, u, u int, well, I say u int, I mean, you know, uh, an unsigned 32-bit integer here. And it's parse, I guess this parse here says, well, hey, um, I'm taking a string and I'm parsing it, but parsing, parsing it to what? Because in JavaScript, you'd say parse int, but here, you uh, this parse function, I guess, knows, because I've put u32 here, that it should parse it to u32. Remember, this is a compiled language, so it's able, I guess it's able to do this, the compiler can do this kind of thing. And, um, yeah, and now that this is a, a, U, a U32 type, which is the same as the secret number, we will be able to run this. Ah, uh, yeah, this is interesting. Yeah, because, okay, so there's the standard in read line sets guess as a string. And it will, <clears throat> you know, re return this if it fails. This is just an underlying OS uh, exception. So it's unlikely to happen in this environment. And then here it, it takes the guess and tries to convert it to a U32, but if it doesn't work, it's gonna say, hey man, you know, type a number. Let's try and run this. Cargo run. Ooh. Hmm. Ah, yes, I need to import the ordering stuff at the top. Okay, let's try that again. All right, look, look at this. Okay, cool, so I can type in a number. So it's type in anything. Too big, cool. All right, secret number is one. Let's see it, uh, what happens if I type in crab. Oh, panicked. Okay, so it does actually sort of crash with a scary for non-technical people <laughs> message. It panicked. But then it comes back with this message, please type a number. And then it comes out with more sort of computer stuff, which of course people, most people, most users wouldn't really understand. But maybe it's doing this because it's, I'm running a debug version and maybe the release version wouldn't spit out all of this stuff, I'm guessing. But anyway, it just, uh, it shows that that's working, I think. Let's just check that I get the right answer. You win. All right, cool. It seems to be working. Okay, so we've got to the, I think the last step now, which is basically to run this program in a continuous loop to allow the user to keep guessing. And it looks pretty straightforward to do this. What we need is this loop keyword, it actually creates an infinite loop, which is pretty handy in programming, right? We wanna, <laughs> we ought to create infinite loops. So basically, yeah, we need a break statement here. We need a break in this in this section here. And the way to do that is to give this a little bit more logic. So let me f actually fix the formatting <laughs> myself. And um, yeah, cool. So I'm gonna just add some code of braces here. And I think this, yeah, this would be break like that, I think. Is that right? Yeah. Okay, cool. So let's just run this again. Ooh, I broke it. Found keyword break. 
Uh, because I need the colon there, semicolon. Cool, so my guess is 20, my guess is 19. Yay, I win, and it stopped. And I input a, like a, a non-integer, it will crash. And that's not, that's not good, is it? That's not a good experience. So what we can do is do this. Ah, oh, this is interesting. Okay, so yeah, rather than crashing the program, let's make the game ignore non-numbers so the user can continue guessing. We can do this by altering the line where guess is converted from a string to unit 32. So here where we basically convert, we can expand out what we do after this. Okay, so let's take a look at that. So that comes right after the pars. So okay. So this this returns this pars returns okay or error. And so what we're doing here is we're saying um, if if we receive an okay, then just return that that number. Just return it. If we receive any error, I guess the underscore means any error, then continue. Now, I guess continue means try again. But let's replace this line with that new logic and adjust the formatting and run the program again. Now if I put A, you see it's just keeps, yeah, so I can't crash it as I was before. Right. What was the number? 89. Okay, cool. This is the final version of the game and it fits nicely into one little window here. And now when I look at this, I understand everything that's going on in this little program, which is pretty cool. We've come a long way, I think now. And this is definitely helping my journey with Rust and um, as I mentioned, I am really learning this for getting into understand writing smart contracts in Rust and to be able to audit smart contracts written in Rust. So understanding the Rust programming language as best as I can, I think is going to go a long way to help when I get to start writing and looking at and auditing Rust contracts. So that's the first program. This is the Hello World program, if you like, with a bit more complexity. It's, uh, I call it Hello World program because it's like an intro program, but it does introduce a lot of different things here. We've got the loop, we've got breaking, uh, some things that are, in my opinion, seem to be very rough specific, like this match, which takes these different arms. This is pretty cool. The um, reference uh, variables, syntax, and uh, the shadowing part here which is nice so we have it guessed as a string and then here it's an int um, again we're using the match which is a nice example of using match and also sort of importing libraries uh, packages from cargo as well as a standard library random number generator print line macros functions and of course cargo so pretty good Okay, I think it's time to take a break for me personally and move over to the next chapter, which is all about common programming concepts.